Can You Be a Gay Christian? Part 4. Well, we're going to back up a little bit, and uh, rather than take head on more of the arguments, we need to build a foundation first. And so we're going to look at biblical sexuality. What does the Bible say are the purposes of sexuality? Well, here they are. One purpose, of course, is procreative. That is, sexuality is supposed to take place to make babies. Genesis 1, 27 through 28. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So the command for sexuality is given to the man and woman, first and foremost, to procreate. Now, notice the context with which, into which it is given. It is one man, one woman committed to each other for a lifetime. Why? Because one of the purposes is that it's procreative. That's why this cannot be extended to homosexuals. Uh, it cannot be extended to people who are not committed to one another because they might have children. Well, of course, you can't if you're homosexual. Uh, but the context for healthy children, the best way for that to happen is mom and dad committed to one another in a loving relationship for life. I know that doesn't always happen, but that is the boundary for sexual activity. So it's procreative. Second is that it's unitive. That is, it is for the purpose of bringing unity to the married couple. And here we have Genesis 2. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make, a, I will make him a helper comparable to him. Therefore, a man shall, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So here's the positive command for sexuality. It's unitive. It's one man, one woman, committed to each other in a loving relationship for life. Those are the boundaries. I'll tell you what, the best illustration I've ever heard for this would be something like a fire. Fire is a good thing within boundaries. If you have a stove or a fireplace, that's a good boundary. But if you just kindle the fire in your living room under the Christmas tree, not such a good boundary. That's not a boundary at all. It becomes quite destructive. And so the same is true with sexuality. God did not give us sex and then give us boundaries to ruin our fun. He gave us boundaries to protect us and to build us up. And so that's the reason for it. And here's where we need to start as Christians. But what did Jesus say about marriage? What did Jesus say about sexual expression? Well, here's what he said. He reaffirmed the Old Testament. He reaffirmed what God's Word had already said. When asked about divorce, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, that's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that Jesus reaffirmed the Old Testament ethic that we find in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. But I want you to remember as well, Christians, we need to keep in mind what he said regarding divorce, because we treat that way too lightly in our culture. All right, now, here comes the objection. Very common objection, but very easy to get past in several ways. Some people will say, hey, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. And the implication is, therefore, it's not a sin. The second implication is, why are you saying something about it? If he never said anything about it. Okay, is it true? Is it true that Jesus never said anything about homosexuality? Yes, it is true. He never used the word, never talked about the subject. However, this is an appeal to ignorance. All right, if you're using that as your evidence, that's not good evidence, just because he never said it. 
Now, in this case, you could make the argument that it's an appropriately used appeal to ignorance. If that subject is completely off the books, so to speak, when it comes to the Bible, then you might have a case. However, with Jesus, that's not the case. And let me give you some lines of reasoning why. First is this. Now, I didn't make this one up. This is a good one I heard, I think, from um, a caller to Stand to Reason at str. Dot .org. The host name is Greg Kokel. He's written a fabulous book called Tactics. He had a caller who said Jesus silence affirms that it's sin. So if Jesus never said anything about the subject, that must mean that it's a sin. Why? Well, it's because if you read the gospels, particularly in Matthew starting with chapter 5, Jesus takes great pains to correct the Jews' misunderstanding of the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. That's what the Beatitudes is made up of. Not totally, but a large part of the first portion of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus correcting their misunderstanding or misapplication of the Old Testament. So if Jesus thought that homosexuality was okay, then he should have corrected the Jews' misunderstanding of God's word. He should have done it, but he didn't do it. He was culturally a Jew. Jesus then, by his silence, is affirming that homosexual activity is a sin. Here's what we do know Jesus did. Jesus reaffirmed sexual expression within the bounds of one man and one woman for life. I just read you the passage. It was, it, and you can find it in at least Matthew. I think it's probably also in Mark. But he reaffirmed it. God said, one man, one woman, one flesh. That's the way it works. And then another is, I, it amazes me how many people who call themselves Christians reject this. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. If he is Emmanuel, God with us as we sing every single Christmas, then he is the one through whom that word was spoken. He is the one who spoke it. He is deity in flesh. Therefore, the Old Testament, which we affirm to be the word of God, means that Jesus spoke it. So the things you see there are the things that Jesus verified as being true. And in fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says so. Uh, he, he affirms all that's in the law and the prophets. And so Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. So if you see a condemnation of homosexuality in the Old Testament, then um, that would mean that there's an issue with it in the New Testament as well. So let's look for a second at what the Old Testament actually has to say. Now, let me encourage you that you don't really need to use the Old Testament. I know that one of the first places a person will go, or one of the first references they'll give in this subject, is Sodom and Gomorrah. I think you don't even need to go there. I think that's probably the worst possible reference. Now, there is homosexuality involved in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. However, it's attempted gay rape. It's not what anybody would consider a loving homosexual relationship. So don't use that one. And and some of the prophets as well condemned Sodom and Gomorrah, not just for their inappropriate sexuality and violence, but for uh, neglecting the poor. There were a lot of things they weren't doing that they were supposed to be doing, and some overt things they were doing that they weren't supposed to be doing. So don't go there. But you might go places like this. Leviticus 18 and 20. I would be cautious. In fact, you would probably be all right to avoid this just because it's going to get you into a long discussion that could be unfruitful if you've got somebody who's a steamroller and they're not actually listening to your argument. But look at what Leviticus 18 and 20 say. These are two verses that, that say similar things. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. An abomination was the worst sin you could commit. God hates it. That's what makes it an abomination. Leviticus 20. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. 
they shall surely be put to death. Now that would seem to be end of story, close the book, we're done. Not the case, because people will ask, are these verses still relevant today? Should you be using these verses out of the Old Testament? And here's what they'll point out if they've read it. They will tell you, well, not only does the Old Testament tell you, does it tell the Israelites not to engage in homosexual activity, it also says not to sow two different kinds of seed in your field or wear a garment made of two different kinds of material. It also says not to eat pork, not to eat shellfish, and, and you have these prohibitions. And so what they will say is, well, why is it that you will point out homosexuality, but you'll eat a barbecue or a bacon sandwich? Why is it that you'll wear a polycotton blend, but you go around saying that homosexuality is wrong or evil? That seems inconsistent at best. Maybe it's hypocritical. Maybe it's just because you're a terrible homophobe. You're a hater, and that's why you're cherry-picking verses to suit your hatred. Uh, and, and that's really where they'll go with this. And they have a good point if you don't know the Bible and if you don't know the whole scope of what's going on, and most Christians don't. Here's what a lot of folks uh, do not know. There are actually three different kinds of laws in the Old Testament, not just one. There are ritual or ceremonial laws. Uh, those are now considered to be non-binding on Christians. Uh, and, and I would say Jewish Christians as well. Why? Because the temple is gone. Sacrificial system is gone. There's a new covenant. So all of that stuff is non-binding. There are also dietary laws that are now non-binding. How do we know they're, they are non-binding? It's because the New Testament specifically sets them aside. If you read the book of Acts, Peter had a vision where God pronounced all foods clean. So we know that those are gone. There, the, there are also moral laws in the Old Testament. Those are still binding unless they are specifically set aside. All right, uh, so th that's the way you have to view Old Testament law. And you really have to know the Bible to be able to sort these things out. I also want you to notice that uh, there was no death penalty for sowing your seed with two different kinds of, sowing your field with two different kinds of seed or wearing uh, cloth with two different kinds of material. Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't a death penalty with that. So it's not even in the same league with these other types of uh, prohibitions. Here's the thing to keep in mind too. Israel, Israel was to be a community set apart. They were to be set apart in every way. I honestly can't figure out what all of these Old Testament laws were for. Some of them seem to serve no practical purpose except to say, this is going to set you apart from the people around you. They need to see that there's a noticeable difference. Now, it could just be because thousands of years have passed and we simply don't understand the customs. For example, I've heard that wearing uh, clothing with two different kinds of material or planting your field with two different kinds of seed was often a pagan practice, a pagan uh, ritual to invoke uh, power from other gods. I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what I've heard. But things are still morally binding unless they're set aside by the New Testament. And I'll tell you up front, homosexual activity has not been set aside by the New Testament. In fact, it has been highlighted as a sin, which is what we're going to look at next. But what I shall do is wait until the next video.